Hi Booktube and welcome to a new video. This is a Friday Reads video for four books read. Amelie Smith, a Danish author. Fred Ripper, translated by Jennifer Russell for the Danish. Uh, Fire Rush by British author Jacqueline Crooks. Rather beautiful cover. Uh, Catalan uh, author Nurio Bendicho. Deadlands, translated by Baruxa Rerano and Martha Tennant. And finally, uh, my annual uh, Percival Everett read. This one is called Assumption. It was from 2011. So I'm going to start with the uh, the Amelie Smith Threadripper. Um, so I can't actually think of a more Mark Nash book than this. Um, when I say Mark Nash, I don't mean Mark Nash the author, I mean Mark Nash the reader. I absolutely love this. Um, Goodreads have produced a list of potential titles for the Booker International long list, and this was one along with um, Nuru Bendicho that's got a chance of being on it. I'll be interested to see if it is on it. So um, it's, I'll just show you what it looks like visually. So you can see it's very spaced out on the page. And this side is called text and this side is called notes. And in that respect, it reminded me of the Mina Kandasami book, Exquivit Cadavers, where what, uh, and I'll post a link to my uh, extensive discussion about that book, because although that book failed, I think it does some really interesting things. I think this does similar, but far more successfully. And what it's doing is the notes is sort of feeding into the text. Uh, the text is, of, in this case, is of the protagonist's uh, actual life with her partner, who she's sort of not really committing to within the relationship. You know, are they going to have children, aren't they? And also she's got a commission for an artwork, uh, which is basically uh, paid for by a governmental agency. And it's a, it's a huge body of work. So th those are the two aspects of the text. And then the notes that feed into that are basically things like research, idle thoughts historical connections that inform her life, but also inform, uh, obviously, the, the art project. And the art project is a, is a sort of a, uh, a weaving sort of textile piece. And she provides in the notes an absolutely fascinating history of weaving and all the connections it has to modern life. So first of all, it starts with uh, Penelope, uh, the wife of Odysseus, who is weaving on a loom and she, you know, she says to the suitors that I need to weave this, um, this shroud garment for my father-in-law. When it's finished, then I will attend to, to, to your suits. And what she does is she weaves through the day and they see it through the window. That that's what she's doing. So they leave her alone. And at night she unravels, she unpicks the work so that it never gets done. So that she never has to stop weaving and therefore address the suitors. And in a way, this book is both weaving connections between things that you wouldn't necessarily feel are connected, but also, I think, in, in sort of the uh, indirect way, the protagonist is unpicking connections to her life, trying to get down to sort of brass tacks, you know, what's at the core of her existence, you know, what's at the core of her relationship. So that's, that's set, that frames the novel, the, 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 the Penelope thing. But the history of the loom, it's, it's a very old technology. Um, I forgot which two she suggests that uh, it actually preceded, but you'd be surprised. And then the French uh, inventor Jacquard uh, basically invented a punch card system for his loom. And that was the precursor of the computer, of course. And in the UK, uh, Charles Babbage worked with uh, Lord Byron's daughter, who's called Ada Lovelace. Uh, he was in his 40s. Lovelace was in, you know, just barely a teenager, but she was a maths uh, genius. And they worked together to basically, they, they came up with a prototype, or no, I should say the blueprint, because it was never actually put into practice. The blueprint of the first computer based on Jacquard's loom system. So that's, that's sort of a partial history of the loom. Then once you had, uh, sort of industrialised, sort of mass production looms, you had, uh, which threw a lot of people out of work because they were basically being replaced by machines. Um, you had the Luddite movement in, in the UK where, where disgruntled weavers 
uh, tried to smash up the loons that were denying them their, their livelihoods and their, their job. So those are, that's sort of the history of the loon. But what's so brilliant are these connections that she makes in the notion, as I say, of weaving and threading and also unpicking. So we get links to things like DNA. Um, we get, you know, a, a disquisition on how, through the material of um, the textile that's being woven, produces an image, the picture on the tapestry or on, on the woven carpet or whatever it is. And that play of symbol and material object. So it's also a sort of phenomenological uh, inquiry. There's just so much to this book and it's so economically done. While the pages are both the same, i.e. that's page 51 in text, that's page 51 in notes, so it's actually double the length. So I think it's about 216 pages. It's a very quick read. I mean, I read of the 108 pages doubled up to 216, I read 70 or 140 in the bath. And it didn't take me long to finish um, the whole book afterwards. It's just such a feast of ideas and inventiveness and thought provoking. And just to give you an idea, I'm going to give you a couple of... It's almost aphoristic in style, not quite. I've sent my saliva to 23andMe in a plastic tube in a cardboard box, hoping to trace my ancestry back to single-celled organisms. So she's not just there, she's not just making a connection back to whatever her, her hereditary line is. She actually wants to go all the way back to the appearance of life on Earth. Metaphorically, I mean, she doesn't literally expect that to happen, obviously. Neural networks see with the eyes of the paranoic. There are faces concealed in flowers and flowers in faces. Everything is a sign. Space and scale collapse. Details come flooding in the nuances, in the gradual transitions. I love that idea of our drive to always seek pattern in everything makes us paranoics because we're so desperate. We so crave meaning through pattern. I just think that's, that's brilliant. And there you also get the idea of the, the sort of the weave of um, a loom to, to its sort of... Um, the inheritance it conveys onto Babbage and Loveless uh, on their um, computer to hear now in the modern age we're building neural networks to try and um, uh, sort of recreate the human mind. It's just so rich. I loved it. I have a deep suspicion this will be in my top ten read of the year. Five stars. And on to Fire Rush by Jacqueline Crooks. Um, this is a novel about uh, dub reggae and a female DJ in the late 70s, early 1980s Britain, a time of racism, uh, obviously it's still a time of racism, but things like people dying in police custody, what was called the Sus Law, which is when policemen could stop people on suspicion uh, without actually having a, you know, hard and fast, they've seen them steal something or anything, and of course that was racially slanted uh, so that uh, Afro-Caribbeans um, and Anglo-Caribbean uh, men were stopped more uh, proportionately than, than white men. So it was a pretty, it was a pretty grim, grim time. It was the time that I grew up in, really, uh, the 70s and 80s. Now, it's also written uh, partially in Jamaican patois. So, in some ways, I think it's a slightly, and I do stress slightly, specialised read. I think you have to go into it knowing that there's patois in it, a lot of which you can guess the meanings of, uh, but they're all readily online if you go on Urban Dictionary, uh, if, if that's the way you want to approach it. But I do just want to talk about dub reggae before I um, talk about the book itself, because what this book does so well, and what I love about the writing, is... It's very hard to write about sound, um, and I know I've tried in that uh, when I was at college I used to review gigs, and there's only so many ways you can write about drum solos or, or uh, the sound of uh, a guitar riff or, or whatever. The, the language is not really applied to sound. Here, what she does so brilliantly, it's the, it's the best sort of use of written sound that, that I've come across and it's that and it is that because of dub reggae so very briefly reggae is a mu is a music of um or roots reggae particularly is a music of um seeking to get back to one's roots in Africa of uh, uprooted and um dislocated uh communities 
uh, in America, in the Caribbean, in Britain, all over. And, and that, that was the music of reggae. It was, it was a music of, it was a spiritual music trying to um, keep the connections alive to African ancestors, African culture, through the beat, through the sound of the drum. And one of the uh, notions is that you can trace it back to what was called Nyambingi drumming uh, in the region of sort of Ethiopia around there. And that is at the heart of, of reggae. And it's a truly spiritual music. Dub is a uh, takes reggae and it was a music of engineers rather than musicians because what the engineers in, in Jamaica did is that um, they would take singles, uh, reggae singles, and this is in the 70s, 60s and 70s, so they didn't have sampling machines and they only had four track mixing desks and recording studios, you know, they don't have the sophisticated equipment that, that we have today. And they would basically rearrange the, the music. A lot of the vocals would be taken out and a lot of the effects they used were things like reverb, delay, echo, and then they would throw in this sort of random element. So, for example, Lee Scratch Perry is one of the most famous um, sort of uh, remixers. Uh, he, he, one of his kids had this sort of toy cow that if you squeezed it, it made a moo noise. So Perry put it on onto the music. So it's born out of uh, Roots Reggae. But because of all these sound effects, it actually is very otherworldly. And the other thing uh, dub does is it doesn't give you um, it doesn't sort of give you an end point to the song in the sense of the song takes you know a, a three minute pop ditty with the lyrics and everything. It takes you from beginning to end, and then you sort of have uh, everything sort of topped and tailed and, and and sort of nicely rounded. You don't get that in, in dub reggae. The tension is never released. The tension is never resolved. I think. That, that would do as an introduction. <laughs> to, to, and it's a background that comes in useful. I can't, because I have a great love of dub reggae and I, I know about it, I can't put myself in a position of, if I didn't know some of that stuff, would a lot of this make sense? Anyway, so the protagonist is Yamye, who lives in a satellite town of London. She has two very, very close girlfriends, one white, one black, but they're all into, into reggae and dub. And they spend their weekends uh, at a, uh, um, what's called the crypt, which is uh, a basement in a church where there are these sound systems pumping out music with DJs. And what Yamye wants to do more than anything is to become a female DJ, which is very um, challenging because Rastafarianism in the 70s and 80s, I can't speak for it now, was quite, it was quite a patriarchal religion. It's based on the Old Testament as much as the New Testament. So she faces a lot of challenges there and it's interesting that it's in the crypt of a church because in the 70s you had house parties where because discos were either racially uh, profiled and, and, and uh, afro-caribbean people weren't allowed in or they were just too expensive they held their own parties in in houses and they but they were re restricted to the basements um because there, there was obviously lots of marijuana being smoked there was alcohol being sold uh, without a license, things like that. So it was all very sort of on the down low. And occasionally they would get busted by police raids. But the the, the music, as as the character here says, is always confined to the basement. It's confined underground, literally underground. And she compares it with the fact, you know, that the slave ships held their um, chattel, their, their, their men snatch from, their people snatched from Africa, under the level. Of the, of the deck, you know, in the in the hull of the ships, that it's that the, they're always confined underground, out of sight. Anyway, so the book is in three parts. Part one is in London, is in this satellite town just outside of London, where she's battling to sort of establish herself as a DJ. But Babylon, which is what Rastafarians refer to uh, the forces of oppression in Western societies, uh, is is doing things like um, stop and search, sus, and one of the characters here dies in uh, police custody when he, he shouldn't even have been there, he hadn't done anything wrong. He was just snatched up on suspicion and killed in custody, which was happening, you know, a surprise, I say surprising, but more regularly in the 70s. I mean, I remember it, there are songs about people who died 
in police custody. Now there are a lot more precautions, but it's still happening. There are still people dying, dying in custody, and obviously in America it's even worse. And it all get, it's all coming down on her. It's all too heavy, and she, she has to flee for her sort of mental health and sort of freedom and everything. So she goes to Bristol, where she hooks up with um, this guy called Manasseh, who is a black revolutionary, which is an interesting definition. His revolutionary acts are to exist off the grid, which in the 70s was a lot harder in the UK than it, it may be now. Uh, although with the internet age, maybe you can't uh, live off the grid. But, but anyway, but what that means, you know, that confers him great freedom of manoeuvre and movement. He, they, he lives with her and two other guys in what they call the safe house which turns out to have linked... Bristol was the preeminent city in Britain uh, for the slave trade because it's a port on the West Coast, so it was, it was taking slaves from Africa to America. Um, but the interesting thing is he affords his lifestyle through criminality, uh, through stealing, basically. So just how revolutionary is his act? It's, it's a debate in the book, and an interesting one, I think. Um, but... While in London, or just in the satellite town of London, Yamye was sort of struggling against Babylon, the forces of oppression. Here, the oppression is from her own Rasta brothers, these guys, because of the patriarchal nature of the religion. You know, she has a terrible time. Um, and so she resolves that she's going to go to Jamaica in part three, where her mother uh, left her father in London, or again, in the satellite town, um, and then disappeared, and she's going to see if she can find out what happened to her, and that's part three. So that's the plot, and it's based on uh, Crooks's life, apparently, uh, and it's very satisfactory, it's fine, but what elevates this book above, as I say, I think is the quality of the writing, and particularly about sound. So just to give, this is on page one, so you launch straight into it. I follow a sassy inside. My guile knows the smoke. Beneath barrel vaulted arches, dance hall darkness, pile up bodies, ganja clouds. We lean against flesh eating limestone walls near two coffin sized speaker boxes that vibrate us into the underworld. And again, throughout the book, the metaphors, the extended metaphors of this association with sound, of bass and drum beat, of dub reggae, with connecting back to the ancestors of the tribal beats of the Nyabangi, Nyabingi, and, and the, whole, the whole thing is just constantly and brilliantly observed. You know, it never gets repetitive. You'd think it would. But, you know, you, the use of words like reverberation and uh, echoplex and things like that, e echolocation, things like this, it just works. It just works. We all go out two or three times a week, middle of the night. Sometimes Manasseh does a break-in alone. Most times they go together and leave me in the car for hours as lookout. I'm in too deep, but the frequencies of pain and pleasure are reverb and delay, mixed up, disorienting me. Three seasons in the safe house and I'm not sure what I've become. So, again, it's what I was saying, is that music is feeling, and feeling is music for Yamye, and it works, it really does. Um, and then... There's this thing called, like I say, the, 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 the dub DJs would take a seven inch single and they would release, you know, they'd mix and release a, what's called a version, usually instrumental, but not always, on the B side. And in Jamaica, because they had uh, these sort of weekend uh, sound system parties, the DJs for each of those parties with their own sound system would queue up outside the, the studio for a unique pressing so that the engineers would mix different versions of the same song for each of the different DJs. They would each get a unique one. And again, it's an extended uh, idea of um, the, this notion of a version, a version of truth, such as the police put in, in when they're, uh, there's an inquiry into the death in custody. The version of Yamye, of who she is, under all these different I influences... When a sinkhole opens up, Bongo Natty is telling everyone that the sinkhole is an underground cave. Echolocation. Aya, the ancestors trying to reach us from hideouts below ground.
So I just think the writing in here is really, really good. And obviously when she goes to Jamaica and she is closer to the ancestral roots of reggae itself, but also her mother and that sort of uh, synergy between the two. This is when I come alive, blown out of my thoughts by high frequency vibe. Outside the music, I feel wrong in this yard time. Manasseh's words all over my body. Here in the outer sphere is the only place where death of the body is the birth of the voice. The only place I feel no shame. So again, like I was saying, sound is feeling and feeling it's sound. I just thought the writing in here was terrific. I, like I say, though, I do think I, I'm not sure if you're not acquainted with some of the cultural things of reggae. Uh, and also the experience of, of being black in Britain in the 70s and 80s. I don't know how different that was to being black um, in America. So I'll be very interested if any Americans uh, pick this up and, and what they make of it. But I, I highly recommend it. Five stars. And on to uh, Nurio Bendicho, Deadlands. Uh, as I said, this also is on that good read list for the uh, International Booker. I was less uh, taken with this, I have to say. Um, it's very well put together, very competent, but ultimately it's a version of Rashomon uh, meets the House of Bernardo Alba. Uh, and I didn't think it ever really transcended either of those influences. And also the influence, and she says she has a love for Faulkner in, in the afterword, of uh, As I Lay Dying. So it's 13 points of view, uh, but chronologically spaced out on an event where in this very, very oppressive, almost barbaric country family uh, in Spain. Uh, one of the sons is shot in the head and dies. Uh, and you're, you're gradually building up a picture of how this state of affairs came to pass. The sort of ancestral history, or the, you know, the recent ancestral history, the post uh, shooting history, and it all comes together by the time of the 13th witness, as it were. Well, I say witness. The witness to the family is going on. No one actually witnessed the shooting other than the shooter. Um, and it's a tale of incest and bastardy and exploitation and neglect. There's a lot of references of people being sent away to go and eat, either because they haven't or it's the way of getting them out of the way. So a discussion could be had. Some of the writing is really good, but... As I say, I just felt, well, it's Rashomon, we've seen that. The family is so unpleasant. And in a way, it reminded me of that Dutch novel that won the Booker International a couple of years ago called The Discomfort of Evening. And I'm not overly taken with stories of rural families and the violence uh, and the isolation and the lack of worldliness, the sort of intense... Uh, sort of navel gazing because there is no outside world effectively um i they those type of books don't really draw themselves to me and i i you know as i say it's it's perfectly serviceable and if you're interested in those things uh i think you'll get more out of it than i do but i gave this three stars and on to Assumption by Percival Everett so this is my 10th Everett novel and i think there are two types of Everett novels there's the one which is sort of very political about race, ethnicity, uh, racism, uh, which is usually treated through satire. So books like The Trees, Percival Everett by Virgil Russell, Erasure. And then there are other books of his where the main character is still black, but ultimately they're just telling a story. They're not as satirical. They're not as political. There's nothing wrong with that. But they don't. to me, they don't deliver more than the story. Things like Dr. No this assumption. Um, interestingly, a book like Telephone was a superior story and I really enjoyed it. I gave it five stars, but again, it's not really, apart from sort of people trafficking, it wasn't really that political. But anyway, this is uh, about uh, a, sh a deputy sheriff, a black deputy sheriff in New Mexico, so he's the only black man in authority. It's otherwise it's whites and Native Americans. So he sort of stands out a bit. And what surprised me, what I wasn't anticipating, is there are three three separate cases that aren't related. I kept reading on expecting them to be related. They're not related at all, other than the fact that they're his cases. Um, so that was a bit frustrating. Um, 
and you know it's very down home he spends a lot of time sort of traveling to interview people attached to the cases and then back to his mother's even though he lives alone and talks about the food that she prepares for him things like that um there's not a lot of the stuff about him being the only sort of black authority figure it's, it's very much sort of down in the mix and each of these three cases finishes explosively very abruptly it's all sort of tied it away in, in quite shockingly uh, abrupt fashion, as I say. Again, which I wasn't expecting. And then the actual thing tying it all together by the end, yeah, I see, but I wasn't... It didn't, it didn't really reclaim the book for me. I thought this was a very middling book, three stars. And in a way, in terms of the character, uh, it's done better, I think, in a novel not by Percival Everett called The Killer Inside Me. I've forgotten who the author's name. I'll, I'll put it across the screen. So a bit disappointing. At the moment, I've only got one more Everett in my to-be-read to pile to read. I think it sounds more of the political than this. Um, and I will, you know, I will work my way through his oeuvre. I will be buying more Everett books. But I'm now wary that there are great Everett books and uh so so ones and that's it for this week uh just a reminder that the reason it's taken a while since my last uh, reading wrap ups because my own book uh the death of the author in triplicate uh, came out at the end of february i'll post all the links to it to extra content to where you can buy it because it's not on amazon um what it's a you know what it's about and stuff i'll post it in the show notes uh until then uh till the next video thanks very much